wonderful, wonderful is a Jesus our Lord. Wonderful eyes have seen, ears have heard. What's recorded in God's Word is a Jesus our Lord. Wonderful, yes, isn't He wonderful? <coughs> wonderful, wonderful is a Jesus our Lord. Wonderful eyes have seen, ears have heard. What's recorded in God's Word is a Jesus our Lord. Wonderful, oh, is that He? Sing it to Him. <coughs> is that Jesus our Lord? Wonderful, eyes have seen, ears have heard. What's recorded in God's Word is a Jesus our Lord. Wonderful. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what? We could sing that song all night long, and it's still the truth. Isn't he wonderful tonight? Do you love him better than everything in this world? Has he been better to you than anybody in the world? Don't you love him tonight? Isn't it a privilege to love the Lord? Isn't it a privilege to be a Christian? All right here in Satan's house, in his world that he so has such a domain over. Here we are, victory in Jesus. Victors in Christ the Lord. That ought to make you the happiest human being alive tonight. Everybody you look at, Brother Terry, their plate is just about full with all kinds of situations and problems and things going on. But aren't you glad you got somebody to turn to? What if you was having all these problems that didn't have Jesus? to turn to. I'm glad I love him tonight. I'm glad he loves me more. He loves you more. I'm telling you the truth. Somebody say praise the Lord. Let's just give him a real good hand clap of praise tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Now you may have to run around a little bit to do it, but why don't you shake hands with somebody in the house tonight. Shake their hand. Let's sing that again, if you will. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus? I love you, buddy. Wonderful. Love you, Brother Jonathan. Ears have heard what's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus our Lord? Wonderful, one more time. Well, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Is that Jesus our Lord? He's so wonderful. Eyes have seen, ears have heard what's recorded in God's Word. Is that Jesus our Lord? Wonderful. You got to sing that one more time. Is that He? Oh, wonderful. Is that Jesus our Lord? Wonderful. Eyes have seen, ears have heard what's recorded in God's Word. Is that Jesus our Lord? Wonderful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is Brother Joel Brown in the building tonight? Come up here, buddy. You just blended in with everybody. I couldn't tell who, where you was at. Don't we love this guy right here? We love you so much. <laughs> Amen. My voice is a little bit shaky still. I'm going to ask Brother Joel just to give you a little bit of help tonight. And with him and me and you 
And if the Lord will get in it, it's going to be beautiful. You appreciate these musicians we got up here tonight. Amen. God bless you. We love every one of you. Amen. We love every one of them. We certainly do. Now, I asked Brother Terry tonight. I had surgery on my left eye. I can see real good if I, if I do that. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask Brother Terry to read the prayer request tonight and, and pray over the request. You have needs. I'm sure there's many needs among us tonight in the building. I know there's all kinds of situations going on, sickness, people traveling on the highways. Certainly want to pray for the meeting down in Manchester that the Lord would just anoint our pastor and anoint that group of people as they worship. We're here tonight to worship the same God that they're going to be worshiping down there. He's going to be here as well as there or wherever. He's in the midst tonight. Do you know that? Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. Give him one more good hand clap of praise tonight, Brother Terry, if you'd come. If you'd come. Praise the Lord. Certainly appreciate Brother Terry tonight also, don't we? Amen. Request now as we look over them for just a moment. Brother Samuel Shuffler, he has a written quick request here. Some things he mentioned, and we won't go into that, but he's got a request on his heart. We just... Pray that the Lord would undertake in behalf of that request. Sister Linda Phillips, <clears throat> please pray for Dorcas Hale. She's in the hospital, very serious condition. That's Sister Linda's sister, so we don't remember her as we pray. Carter Lawson sends in requests. Remember my brother having surgery Monday and pray for his salvation. Also remember Tony Templeton in South Carolina, serious cancer in the blood. His dad is a message pastor, so let's remember this request also as we pray. Um, pray for Sister Barbara Gravely is having a, a sinus test Tuesday morning, so we want to remember her as we pray. Sister Janet Payne puts in this request. Sister Joanne Tesla and Sister Linda Jabonski need prayer. Both are, have the flu. They just want to say they love everybody and want to be in church. That's our desire is to be in church. So let's remember this as we pray. No name on this one. Please pray for Sister Martha Johnson. She's running a fever and sick and unable to be in church tonight. So we we'll to remember her as we pray tonight. We have seven or eight requests that are sent into the library. This one from Brother Randy Scott. Please remember me in prayers. I've been having an issue for the past couple of days with my left eye. God bless you all. Thank you, Brother Randy. I want to pray for Ruth Ann Yance, sick. Somebody sent this one in. Uh, Ruth Ann Yance, she's sick, unable to be in church tonight, so let's remember Sister Ruth Ann. Uh, Teresa Sawyer, Sister Teresa Sawyer sent this one into the library. I would appreciate so much if you remember my family and your prayers. We have several medical issues going on. I also have to take my sister-in-law to the University of Virginia, to University of Virginia Hospital for surgery. We're leaving Thursday. Please pray for a safe journey and positive surgical outcome. Thank God you and thank you. Uh, thank you and God bless you and Sister Teresa Sawyer. So we want to remember this. I know the Lord is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Every request means, means a lot to the Lord. He just said, can you believe? Amen. Just appropriate that faith. Amen. Sister Kathleen Higgins worked, sent into the library. I stream services in Kansas. The doctor tells me I have cataracts. I ask for prayers. Thank you and God bless you. So let's remember her. Brother Brandon Green sent this into the library. Please keep our family in prayers. We've had a rough month dealing with sickness. We love you all, Brother Brandon. So we certainly want to remember that request. Brother Greg, Sister Julia May, they live in Alabama apparently. Please pray for our community. Uh, Lee County, Alabama, we were hit with a catastrophic tornado that has claimed 23 lives, seven fatalities out of one family, two being children. Many families without a home. Thanking God our families was blessed to have only lost power. You know, there's no doubt that we're transitioning into that six seal interruption of nature, extreme weather everywhere. Um, but we're just, we're thankful that it's not any worse than it is, but God, I believe, will take care of his children. Amen. Brother Derek Butt sent this into the library. I would like for you to pray for my dad, Raymond, but he had uh, a stroke around a week ago and now has bleeding on the brain. He is 94 years old. <clears throat> And before this happened, he has never been, had any sickness or been in the hospital. He's been serving the Lord since he was a young man. He is a message believer, and we all believe that the Lord can heal him. Thank you, and may the God bless you. So we remember that. Even if you're 94 years old, God can still heal. 
This one was sent to the library. Please pray for Sister Victoria Thomas and her family. Her daughter, April, is still being rebellious, and her disability hearing will be in the near future. Also, her husband has a lawn care business, and she asked that we would pray that God would bless it so they can better provide for their family. The last one, pray, pray for Brenda Harmon. She has the flu. How many has an unspoken request signified by a raised hand? We all have needs. How many believe that he uh, can, can take care of those needs? He's an ever-present help in a time of trouble. As we look to the Lord tonight, you believe. I'm going to lead in prayer, but we're all going to pray, and you believe with me. Want to put a 1,000 in flight, two ten thousand? We believe the devil's on the run because we are believers and we are overcomers. We're not survivors. We're overcomers. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, how thankful we are that we have another opportunity to be in the house of God. Lord, if we just... If we could just, we have no, real, we have an idea, but we don't know really in days uh, and months how close we are to the rapture, but we know we're very, very close. But Lord, whether I would live out my natural lifetime or it would be in the next few months, I still want to live every day like this was going to be the day of the coming of the Lord. So we're thankful, Lord, that you open up our eyes. We're not in, in Babylon any longer. Or we're not in denominational bondage any longer. We have been given this spirit of, of, of freedom, the spirit of to, to worship you according to the dictates of our heart. You've opened our eyes and our understanding. We're thankful, Lord, for present-day truth. Oh, God, how that the mighty God unveiled before us. Lord, I think about Abraham. He wanted to see God. Moses wanted to see God. All the prophets wanted to see God, and they got a glimpse perhaps of God but Lord you the mighty God has actually been unveiled before us in this last generation we truly can see who God is the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior God becoming flesh how we certainly can identify with that we love you we we thank you Lord for the revelation that we're, we we believe that we come from God and we're going back to God I pray for each one of these requests I've read them Lord the the the, the sound is out in the airways and Lord each one of us We've been given a portion of faith, and we pray, God, that you would join your faith with our faith, and that will make it perfect faith. And we'll believe for these requests, and we'll see testimonies come in in behalf of these requests. Because you promised it, and you said, ask abundantly that your joys may be full. May you bless the service tonight as our brother Matt, I believe, to, to minister to us tonight. Give him the words to speak. May you not have to search, Lord, but may they just come flowingly, and may we pull on the gift of God. And may when we leave this building, we say, it's surely been good to be in the house of God. Lord, I believe you'll bless every person that made the effort to come out to worship you. No matter what we're going through, the hardships, the hard times, family issues, Lord, there's just all kinds in Satan's Eden, Satan's paradise. But Father, we know that you promised, God, you promised to give us some supreme grace and supreme hour. So Lord, we believe we're living in that supreme hour. The cup of iniquity certainly is almost full. Watch over, bless our pastor where he's at, keep him safe, bless the services down there, bless our service tonight. We ask it humbly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Right. Okay. All right. And what, I don't think we had a, a re request turned in in regard to Brother Nathan Ball. But I think yesterday was it yesterday. He had quadruple bypass surgery. He had went to the hospital uh, for a stress test. And they would not let him go home. Said, you're going straight to surgery. So he was in pretty bad shape and they the word I got today he was very sore and a lot of pain but we know God's able to touch our brother I believe the Ball family that might be where a lot of those folks are at this weekend so let's just pray for the Nathan Ball and his family and I believe that Little Haven is in the hospital there in Nashville with him uh, and, and of course another room but I don't know exactly what her situation is but uh, Little Haven was in the hospital there with where Brother Nathan's at. So let's remember those folks tonight. Good people. We appreciate Brother Joel Brown, don't we? I tell you what, the we love you, buddy. I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to think about this congregation without them in it. Would you? They're part. Just, we're just part of you, and you're part of us. Like it or not, buddy, you're just part of us. He's made a song famous around here, and we'd love to help him sing it. Anybody want to know where you're going, tell him you're fixing to leave. You got leaving on your mind. Is that right? Somebody say praise the Lord. Oh, look at somebody and give them a big smile and say, let's have church tonight. Amen. Let's just have church tonight. Somebody say glory. Give him another good hand clap of praise. Amen. Sing her, buddy.
If you want to know where I'm going, oh, where are we going? Where I'm going, oh, let's sing it. Oh, if anybody asks you. take the pain. He's given us a promise. The heartache that life brings. Through sickness, through trials, I have comfort in knowing. When I get discouraged, I know I'll soon be gone. As God gives me grace, I believe He'll give us grace, don't you? I'll run this Christ. Will you run this race? Until I see my Savior, you're going to see him face to face. I'm going up yonder. Are you going? We're going up yonder. Let me hear you sing it. Yes, yes. I'm going up yonder. Now, don't let this song become common to you. I'm going up a yonder. I'm going up a yonder to be with my Lord. Yeah. Now I can take the pain. Amen. Usher, if you'd like to the heartache that life is sure to bring. Usher, like I have comfort in knowing. I'll soon be gone As God gives me grace oh, yes. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna live I'm gonna stay in this race Until I see my Savior Till I see Him face to face I'm going in the rapture believe this going in the rapture to be with my Lord I'm going in the rapture I'm going in the rapture I'm going in the rapture to be with my Lord God gives me grace. I'm going to stay in this race until I see my Savior face to face. I'm going up yonder. Thank you, Lord. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder. Stay there a minute. Praise the Lord. We got this in on Brother Jesse, Jesse Sacker. The Sacker family wants to thank all of you for your prayers. You know, Brother Jesse uh, had a major surgery on his ankle, I guess it was. And the doctors told him not to expect him to too much out of him. But he's getting along remarkably well. The Sackers want to thank you for praying. They thank God for the doctor 
doing such a good job. Well, we're just serving a wonderful Savior, aren't we? Praise the Lord. We certainly want to add that to our list tonight just to continue to remember Brother Jesse in prayer that the Lord would just comfort his heart and be with him, give him a speedy recovery. Also, Brother Joel Goss didn't get a note on him, but he's doing uh, better. Had a blood clot. I think they gave that quite a bit of attention on his behalf. So, well, we just pray for all those that are sick among us tonight. We're, we're just a needy people, aren't we? We certainly are. We're such a needy people. You can be seated. I've had you stand a long time. I apologize for that. But if you're visiting with us tonight, we certainly want to welcome you. Glad to have you here. All those that would be streaming the service tonight, we pray that this service <coughs> would be a great blessing to those folks as well. And uh, Brother Joel has made another song. He's brought it from Brother Jewel Forney to Happy Valley. And Brother Joel, Brother Joel we're not going to let you rest or you just wear it out on us. And we'll bring Brother Matt out with this song tonight. You know what the title of it is, don't you? I'm trying to think. Won't it be a time? Won't it be a time? You know, the good times that we have here, fellowshipping around the word of the Lord, we get in heavenly places and then we have to go back out into the world and mix and mingle and, and just, it's a mess out there, isn't it? But won't it be a time when we'll all be together? Never have to worry about time, sickness, aging, pains, debts, Nothing like that. It'll all be gone. Aren't you glad about that tonight? Somebody say praise the Lord. I'm going to let you be seated. And just before Brother Matt comes out, we'll all stand. Brother Joel, Brother Joel I want you to sing Brother Jewel's song with all your heart tonight. Won't it be a time? Amen. Let's sing it tonight. I said, won't it be a time? Well, I looked at my hands, hallelujah, and my hands look new. I looked at my feet, and you know they did too. I looked all around my new home, and my new home did shine. I said, won't it be a time? Amen. Yeah, Won't it be a time? Won't it be a time? Talking with the end. Y'all, we're going to get a new body. Oh, yeah. I looked at my, how many got hands? At my hand. Let me see your hands. Oh, how many got feet? And pick them up and set them down. And you, they did too. Oh, I looked all around me and all around me shine. I said, it's going to be a time. Oh, I'm going to have a time. Are you going to have a good time? Oh, oh I'm going to have a good time. Talking with the angels, won't it be a time? Oh, I said, won't it be a time? Are y'all sure? Won't it be a time? Oh, won't it be a time? Talking with the angels, won't it be a time? Sing it again. I looked at my hands. I looked. Let me see them. Oh, and they look new. I looked at my dancing feet. And I get new feet to dance in church. Oh, I looked all around me. And all around me shine. I said, I want it be young. 
I'm going to have a time. Sing that. I'm going to have a time. Oh, I'm going to have a time. Oh, I'm going to have a time. Talking with the angel. Won't it be a time? Give him a hand clap of praise. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. My, what a time it's going to be. Yes, Hallelujah. I think we're tasting a little bit of that time right now. Amen. We get a taste of it every time we come through these doors. The Holy Spirit comes down. Imagine this is just a portion. <laughs> this is just a little down payment, a little earnest. One day we're going to get the full inheritance. Amen. In this presence you'll live in all the time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Good to be here with you. Amen. So good. Appreciate Brother Donnie for having us. Amen. The invitation to come. And uh, just so thankful. Amen. That we're here. That you're here. That God is here. Did you come with a need tonight? Do you believe we have the need meter? Amen. He's in our midst. Why? Because we invited him to come. And he comes where he's invited. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Isaiah. Amen. We'll just turn straight to the scripture tonight, Isaiah chapter 59. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 59, and we just want to read from verse 16, and we'll read through verse 19. I'd like to speak to you here tonight on a, a title I've given, Raising Up the Standard. Raising up the standard. Now, y'all got to do me a favor here tonight. Because I'm not like your pastor. I'm an evangelist. I, don't, I can't preach 39 parts and then 50 parts of that 39th part. I can't do that. I got one service, of which I probably have four or five parts, but I got to fit it into one. So don't make me lay a foundation and, and you get to the, just get right to the same page as me here tonight. Pull on the word from the very, from the very word go. <laughs> Amen, and we'll get out of here tonight. You believe that? Amen. Amen. Just pull on the Word of God. I have so much the Lord's just inspired me with and just uh, was just waiting on the Lord and which way to go and what direction to take. And I believe, amen, we're just, we're just being obedient to the Lord here tonight. Isaiah chapter 59, let's start at verse 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Sounds like someone's going to war. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful, Lord, here tonight for your word. Lord, that we can have a sure footing. Lord, in an age that's trembling and shaking, a world that's trembling and groping in darkness. Lord, a world that's in fear of war, a world that's in fear of the economy and stressed and pressured. Lord, but you've called a bride away. And Lord, you've spoken a word to that bride, and that word is shalom. It is well. Be at rest. Be at peace. There's no reason to be worried or stirred. Lord, but you've given us that rest here tonight, and we find it in your word. Lord, it's our portion we pray, Father, you'd come and break the word of life to your children. Lord, would you inspire me? Lord, as I looked over these things, Lord, you've put upon my heart. But God, may it be more than just, a, Lord, a, a word that's passed from intellect to intellect. But Lord, let that word sow into the very souls and the hearts of your children tonight. May you receive the glory, Lord, I pray in all things. Be with us, we invite you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This word that we come to, standard, 
uh, that the Scripture is speaking of here in Isaiah. And it says that the Lord shall raise up when the enemy comes rushing in like a flood. The Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. This word standard is, is such a, a, an important word in the age that we live in more than ever before. Because we're living in the age not of seed, but you're living in the age of the maturing of that seed. There was, an, there was a time even in this Laodicean age where things were in seed form in an infant stage. But you're not living in that infant stage, but we're actually right at the, the culmination and the manifestation of all fruits and all seeds. Where the Bible says all seeds would come to maturity, would come to fruition. So we're living at the zenith or the precipice of God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. We're living at the very precipice or the, the climax of God's purpose and Satan's purpose. And you're living in an age where everything is claiming to be right. We take this word standard. And, and here's what we know about the word of God and all the voices in the world. There's only one standard that God has. God does not have many standards. He does not have many choices or ways that are right. But what we know is that not everything that says it's right is actually right. Though there's, there's different religions in the world that claim to have the right way. And there's different people who have different approaches to that right way. You have a world filled with denominations and denominational ideas and the opinions of man. And what we're ripe with in the age that we live in is the opinions of people. Oh boy, opinions are just endless in the age we live in. You can Google it, and what you're getting from your Google search result over a topic that you might Google is different opinions from different intellectual minds or different camps of thinking or people with different ideas. And the world is littered with opinions of people. But there's only one opinion that matters, and that's the opinion of the Word. There's not more than one right way as we live in a world that's so sympathetic to every opinion and so sympathetic to every moral and every idea and, and what people say is morality and, and it's based upon your opinion or how you were raised or the country you were born in. But here's what we know, there's only one right way. Out of all the voices that say they have the truth, there's only one truth. Out of all the opinions that say they know uh, what, what God is, there's only one God. And He's not multiple ways, He's only one way. There's not more than one truth, there's only one truth. There's not more than one baptism, there's only one baptism. There's not more than one right way, there's only one right way. And we're living in a world to where everyone is trying to measure their own standard or use their own measuring line to, to measure what morality is or what is right and what is wrong. Everyone has their own standard uh, of how you should live or standard of how you should dress or standard of what a church is or standard of what a Christian is. But there's only one standard. And it can't be what the world is thinking. You can't, you say, what is the measuring line? I want to read you a quote here from Brother Branham, and this is, this is uh, just, I believe, just brings emphasis, and the brothers have those quotes in scriptures if you want to just display them. Brother Branham says out of the message, the trial, he says, God must bring judgment upon the earth. And God has to have something here, a standard, to judge the world by, because it would be unjust in God to judge the world, and the world knowing no standard to go by. How many believes that's true? The church is the standard. Which one is it? The Word. God said He would judge the world by Jesus Christ. He says in another place in the harvest time, He says, but He's going to judge the world and He's got to have some standard to judge by or He would be unjust to let us go now and live this life without a standard or to be judged. He would be right. Where could you tell what was right? There has to be a standard. And everyone has their own standard. Every church has their own standard. The world has their own standard of what truth is. They have their own standard of their own approach. And you say, should we use the world? Hardly so. The world is ever-changing. 
The, the world is constantly modifying what they believe. There, there's no foundation anywhere on the world. Uh, what they believed uh, just 40 years ago, uh, what they used to call wrong, they now call right. What they used to call right, they now call wrong and old-fashioned and out of sync or out of touch with the common, the, the world that we live in today. The world, their standard of the world is constantly changing from one age to the next age. Amen. They have no absolute. The world has no typos. And one day the, the, the political view is one, and then the next year it's a different political view. And this politician chair voted for this, and, and five years later they voted against it. And, and you interview and say, well, well what changed? Well, I, you know, I just became more progressive in my thinking. And I used to be under a different teaching or a different school of thought. And, and now I've modified. What is it? It's a different standard. The world standard is constantly changing. And let me say, it's not just changing. It's it's decaying, it's corrupting, it's declining. World's not getting better, the world's getting worse. So you can't use the world by a measuring line. You say, well then which, what should we use? The church. Hardly. The church uh, over that last hundred years has changed their standard. So the prophet of God said, if you're going to use the church, then what church should you use? Everyone reads the same Bible, yet they come up with a different standard. Everyone reads the same history of the church, yet they come away with a different opinion about what the church is, what the church was, what the church should be doing, what the church should be today. The church is constantly denominational systems and religion. It's constantly changing its standard. It's ever changing the measuring line. And you watch even just in religious circles and men who have stood for truth, even just basic biblical truth. And you take a man like uh, uh, T.D. Jakes, who for years was Pentecostal oneness and denounced the Trinity and, and did it and believed in the oneness of God. And then for years he had his ministry there and, 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 and he told that. But, but just years later, he, he was questioned on it. And he was asked, what do you believe? And he was, he was confronted on it. What happened to T.D. Jakes? His ministry got larger and it got larger. Popularity became greater. Pressure became greater. And he caves into the pressure, denounces the oneness and accepts the Trinity. You say, what was it? His standard changed because his standard was the church. His standard was what men said. His standard is what opinion said. His standard, and this is what the this is the condition that the world is in. There's a constantly evolving standard that is changing constantly. The church has watered the truth down. They have versions of the Bible, even the, even the NIV of popularly read uh, version, not get it into translations. I read from many different translations, but you got to be careful in those translations. Even in the NIV too, are uh, just, just multiple entire verses. Entire verses in the, new, in, the, in, in the book of Mark have been removed. You go read the NIV and look at, the, uh, I think it's in the, in the book of Mark and it comes to, you read verse 9 and verse 10 and there's a verse and verse 11 and there's a verse, verse 12 there's a verse. Verse 13 just has a number. There's no words. It just goes straight to verse 14. What is it? It's an ever-changing world and an ever-changing standard. And you're living in an age where now the standard has been loosed from morals of history. Now we don't take history of the church anymore. But now people are literally creating their own standard, their own view or their own opinion. We're living in the age where the mind of man has been exalted to where the very thoughts of a human being are worshipped above what the Word of God says. The book of Judges, Judges chapter 21 verse 25 Judges speaks of a horrible time uh, and then in those days of Israel. Notice what one verse says. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Because there was no king, God had to send judges because people literally just lived lives as they felt to live it. Everyone was right in their own eyes. Man became his own interpreter. 
Man becomes his own filter. He doesn't have a tie post to go back to. He doesn't have a footing, a foundation to go to. He doesn't have a word to go to. You say, what, what, what makes up your standards? What makes up what you believe? What makes up what, what makes you what's right and what's wrong? My brother and sister, when you reject the word and you leave the standard that God gives, you'll eventually leave this, you'll go to this man and you'll follow his opinion. And then you go to this preacher and this, this theologian. you believe his opinion. And then when you find an opinion you like better, you go to his opinion. And you're constantly evolving. Oh, my brother, that when you leave this word, it's an ever-plunging pit. It's a bottomless pit of man's thinking and, and man's ideas until eventually you just believe what you want to believe. And you live, you say, how are you living? By what's right in my own eyes. You become your own interpreter. You become your own moral compass. You become your own thinker. Now I know the different standards you take today. If we were to poll every single one of you, you'd have different standards of what you call a clean house. You'd have different standards. All of us would vary what a clean car is. We'd all have different opinions of standard of, of what a good job is or how work should be done. Our standards are all a little different, every single one of us. Personal standards. You go over to another country and you live in another person's home, eat their food, you realize the standard that you have is not the same standard that they have. The standard of cleanliness is different. The standard of sanitation is different. And you cringe at the thought of going into eating food because what is it? Your standard is not the same as their standard. You were raised differently <laughs> than maybe the home that you're in. You were raised with different standards. And everyone has a different opinion. But my brother and my sister, the reality is uh, there's only one opinion. There's only one truth. I know this is so simple here tonight, but I just want to emphasize it. There's only one truth. Only one. Only one right way to approach God. There's only one right way. God wasn't going to take multiple choice. You look at Cain and you look at Abel. God wasn't going to say, well, I accept both of you because you're both right in your own way. You know, Cain, that looks good, Abel, that's actually right, but Cain's is not bad either. You know, I think everyone's right, everyone's a champion, and everyone's a winner, there are no losers. We don't keep score at ball games anymore because everyone's a winner, don't want to tell anyone. But here's the reality, there's a loser and there's a winner. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. And God was only going to accept one way, one truth, one baptism. He wasn't going to accept multiple choice. There was one right way. And today we have millions of ways and millions of opinions. But listen to me, brother. What Christianity is based upon is that we earnestly contend for the faith that was one time delivered to the saints. One time it was delivered right. It doesn't need changed. It doesn't need modified. It doesn't need added to. It doesn't need taken away from. God only says, defend the word that I've sent you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me say this. You say, I think this. Well, what about this and this opinion? People love giving their opinions what they think but let me let me just give you it as straight as I know how God doesn't care what you think <laughs> I know that hurts our pride but God doesn't care what I think God doesn't care what you think we, we can give our opinion over something but there's only one word and that word is unchanging God said I'm gonna send a word and it's gonna be an unchanging word Oh, a time may change, the world may change, politics may change, countries and nations may change. But I'm going to give you a timeless truth. I'm going to give you an ageless word. I'm going to give you a word that was good for Paul, and it was good for Silas, it was good for Peter, and it will be good for you too. It'll never change. It'll never decay. It'll never erode. It will hold its power. It will hold its strength. To the endless ages to come it will not be a dynamic word it won't evolve dynamic meaning changing 
It won't evolve with my opinions or your opinions. The word and the standard God says I'm going to give you isn't going to matter how dark the age gets. Doesn't mean the standard changes. People want to change the standard of the word because the age gets darker. And somehow we think that because the age gets darker, the standard gets lower. No, let me give you, it's the opposite. The light gets brighter. As the darkness thickens, the light brightens. Oh, my brother, Brother Adam says this, notice this. Uh, Brother Brother Adam says, go to the next quote, brother. He says, thus what the church was at Pentecost is the standard. That is the pattern. There is no other pattern. No matter what scholars say, God has not changed that pattern. What God did at Pentecost, he has to keep on doing until the church ages close. He says, if a man is born of the word, being born again, not of corruptible seed, what was it? It was an unchanging word. It was a plumb line that was made to be straight and not to be changed, not to be added to, not to, not to be taken away from, not for us to give our opinion and your opinion. That word opinion is like a buzzword. (laughs) People love to say it. Well, that was Brother Branham's opinion. Hmm. Novel thought. Brother Branham's opinion. Oh, Brother Matt, we can't preach opinion. You know, he had certain things. Well, then who's to say what was his opinion, what wasn't his opinion, what your opinion is, and my opinion, and that was Brother Branham's opinion, and I raised my kids by this opinion and that opinion, and, and it's because I have a different opinion. Well, let me tell you something. I, 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 I'm, I'm not here to preach uh, that, that we should just follow all opinions and follow whatever Brother Branham's opinion of is a hunting rifle or, or a good place to live or, or whatever it was. But when it comes to the Word of God, I think I'll take a man who was vindicated by the pillar of fires. I think I'll take his opinion over any opinion that I have. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What was God sending when he sent the Word? It was a plumb line. And that's why it's important that we keep it straight. That we don't deviate from it. That we don't differ from it. But keep the word of God straight, my brother and my sister. Opinion doesn't bring life. Opinion doesn't bring the dead back to life. The word brings life. The word brings the dead back to life. The word is the only thing that has power. So keep the word straight. Brother Branham says, notice this here, he says, if a man is born of the word, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, he will produce the word. He will produce the word. The fruit or works of his life will be a product of the kind of seed or life that's in him. His works, therefore, will be scriptural. Because that's the seed that's supposed to be planted. You say, what is the evidence of the Holy Spell? He goes, saying amen to the Word of God. But brother, saying amen to the Word of God is not a verbal amen. This is saying amen to the Word of God. When your life produces the Word, you are saying amen to the Word. What was Mary's vindication? It wasn't that she just said, be it unto me, but it was when she produced the word in her own life. I want to say, God, let my life produce the fruit of the word in my life, not an opinion, not a creed, not an idea. Let my life produce the fruits of the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Let it be scriptural. Let it be a life. It's produced by the seed that's in me. Can you say amen here tonight? He says, there he was, the matchless one. Notice this here. He says, there he was, there he stands, the matchless one. And in his hand, the sharp sword with two edges. The word of God and that word would judge us in the last day. In fact, that word is judging even now. For it is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It cuts asunder the carnal from the spiritual. It makes us living epistles. Read and known of all men. I want to say, God, let the word judge my heart here tonight. And make me a written epistle read and known. 
of all men. He says, I know that works. If a man fears that he might not please God, then let him fulfill the word. If a man wonders if he will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear those words. Let him fulfill the word of God in his life. In other words, don't just let it be a lip service. Don't just let you, don't, don't just be a professor. As Brother Random said, we have enough professors. Be a possessor. Be one who possesses the word that you profess. He says the word of truth was the criterion then, it's the criterion now. There isn't another standard. There isn't another plumb line. As the world is going to be judged by one Christ Jesus, even so, it is going to be judged by the word. If a man wants to know how he's making out, let him do as James suggests, look into the mirror of God's word. Don't compare yourself to your brother or your sister or to this church or to that man or that ministry. There's only one mirror, there's only one standard, and that's the word of the living God. What are we trying to be, uh, to, to, to line our lives up to? Not any man, not any opinion, to the Word. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at this here, this, 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 uh, this signet. Notice here in Numbers chapter 1, verse 50. Turn in your Bible if you have a Bible here tonight. Numbers chapter 1, verse 50. I want, I want to just show you something here. When the enemy comes rushing in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard against it. Notice what this standard was in the Bible. It says here in Numbers chapter 1 verse 50, it says, but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony. Numbers is a book that's going to list, it's it's exactly what it means, it's going to number the tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob. It says, Levites over the tabernacle and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and and all the vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. And I want you to, just to pause here, brother, if you want to put up the the slides we have, you can bring that up. I want you to notice here what this meant when it said encamp around. Go to slide five if you have that. What it meant when he said encamp around the tabernacle. We know that Israel was encamped by numbers they were they were, they were placed in a specific position. This picture gives a perfect portrait of that. Of where the, the, the ark of the, of the tabernacle, the, 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 the tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, holiest of holies was at the center of the camp. Now notice here, and keep reading in your Bible, but keep this, this slide up. It says that they shall encamp round about the tabernacle. That was the Levite's place. They were given to the ministerial duties. They were to take care of the tabernacle, to make sure the oil didn't go out in the candlestick. They were taking care of the ministerial, the sacrifices, the duties of the priest. And he says in verse 51, And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levite shall take it down. When the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levite shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Verse 52, And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents. Notice this. The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own standard. That's what the scripture says. Every man shall pitch towards the tent by his own camp and by his own standard throughout their host. No numbers, the very next chapter um, of numbers, numbers chapter 2, verse 2. And every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. The ensign, the signet, the emblem. They shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. What was the ensign? You see, Israel was not going to just be dispersed all over the countryside with the tabernacle in the middle. But God says there's going to be an order by which you live. This isn't going to be just looking like a bunch of homeless people living out in tents and just scattered all across the mountain. But God says there's going to be order. You're going to be placed in a specific spot. And he says each man, Levi, 
Nephtali, Benjamin. You notice all of the brothers, all of the sons of Jacob, Asher, Dan, all of them was to have their own encampment. And if you were under the sign or the emblem of Dan, you camped under that emblem. Brother Branham says this. He says, the scripture says, he says, when the, when the Spirit of God raises, uh, he says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises a standard against it. So when the enemy went out as the Antichrist, God sent a certain type of power out to meet him. He says he went out again as a red horse rider, another color, another power, another ministry. God sent another one after him to combat it, to hold his church. What was it? It was the spirits from the, book, from the, the creatures from the book of Revelations, chapter 4. The throne room of God. What do you have around that throne? You have four living creatures. As Revelations 4, John on the Isle of Patmos says, I seen, he had the face like unto a man. And he's seen a creature with the face of a lion. He's seen a creature with the face of an ox. And then he had a creature with the face of an eagle. Notice these brothers. Go to slide one. These were the creatures that John sees in Revelations. He sees the lion. The face of a lion. And Brother Adam says, what was it? It was the Spirit of God that God was sending, the anointing of God that God was sending to combat the Antichrist spirit. So he sees a lion. You know, Ezekiel sees the very same thing. The difference with Ezekiel is that Ezekiel sees a will in the middle of a will. He sees a moving, see a moving throne. And you go read the, 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 the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel says he falls in by the river of Chabar and falls into vision. And he sees the same thing John sees as John's looking in the throne room of God. He sees four living creatures. This lion. The very Go to the next one, brother. He sees the lion. He sees the man. This was another anointing. Keep going. He sees the ox. Another anointing of Christ. And then go to the next one, brother. Then he sees the flying eagle. And what were these? These were the signets or the standards or the emblems that Israel was camping under. Brother Branham says that. He says that, uh, speaking of speaking of this, he said, Dan was under the eagle anointing. Or Dan was under the eagle signet or the eagle standard. So when Israel, keep going, brother. The very next slide, it should be the same one we were at. When, Dan, when, when you see when they were camped about, I want you to look here in Numbers chapter 2. This is, this is so amazing. The scripture tells us that as Moses sees this image, as he's caught up into heaven, and he sees this image of the house of God, and God tells him, build a tabernacle. Build it exactly like you've seen in the throne room. Build it exactly like you've seen in heaven. So what does Moses do? He builds this tabernacle. And then God says, beyond that tabernacle, I want you to pitch through your tents. Dan, Asher, Nephtali, Ephraim, Reuben. And all of them are going to have, they're going to be called, they're going to be placed under a different standard. Just like in an army today, you have the, the, the different battalions. You take the Air Force or the, the Marines or the Army. They all wear a different signet. What is it? It's a different standard. It gives them, tells them where they're to be positionally placed. To stay in order. And so God says, Moses, I want you to tell them in Numbers 2. He says, tell them to camp based on the ensign of their father's house. So Judah, the camp of Judah, is going to consist of 74,000 people, 74,000 under Judah. Under Issachar, there's going to be 84,000 people. Zebulon is going to have 57,400 people, a total of 186,000 men that that were going to be camped to the east. And all of them were to be under their standard, under their signet. What was this standard? What was this signet? Judah goes out first. And guess what Judah's signet is? You could imagine. A lion. 
because the lion of the tribe of Judah. He comes out of, Jesus comes out of Judah, of that tribe of Judah. Now notice, Judah is, goes first. He's going to be, he's going to be under the standard of the lion. And under Judah, under that same standard is going to be Issachar, Zebulon, who would come in behind Judah, but under the same standard of a lion. They were all camped under that emblem of a lion. God does everything perfect. No mistakes. John sees creatures, lion, ox, man, eagle. Ezekiel sees creatures, lion, ox, man, eagle. What are they? They're defenders. They're guards of the throne. They're the guardians of the throne room. I wish so bad we had time to, to, to preach on this tonight and we don't. But you notice in Eden, when God drives out the man, what does he place in front of Eden? Cherubims with a flaming sword that went every way. You remember that in the Bible? That turned every way, north, south, east, west. What were those cherubims doing? They were guarding Eden. Eden wasn't a place, a geographical location that they were guarding. They were guarding a condition that man fell from. They were guarding an atmosphere that Adam had lost. And now man is driven from Adam's position. And now there's cherubims guarding, guardians. Ezekiel sees those same guardians to the throne room of God. Ezekiel sees the, the man, the, the eagle, the ox. Uh, the, 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 and and what, is, what does John see in Revelation? When he says, behold, I've seen a throne. And he says, and surrounded the throne, 24 elders. Well, where's the patriarchs and the disciples? It was, it was all in type of guardians. What is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Guards of the throne of God. And Brother Branham said they all had a different anointing. One was under the eagle. One was under the ox. One was under the man. What was it? It was all God's guardians defending the way back to Eden. That's why you don't find the formula for the new birth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You find it in Acts. Because they were guarding the way. I don't want to lose, get, to lose you in my thought here tonight. But they were guarding the way. So now what do you have? You have Israel, who's the only possessor of truth. Out of all the nations of the entire earth, God does not say, I'm going to choose Israel, and I'm going to choose the Hittite, and I'm going to choose the, uh, the, the, the Egyptians, and I'm going to choose the Romans. Uh, am I going to choose the, 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 uh, the Hittites and the Perizzites? I'm going to use the Canaanites, and, but I'm going to use Israel too. And I'm going to have, everyone's going to have truth. Everyone's going to be, everyone's going to be the ambassador of God. No, he chooses one little nation, one elected family to be the ambassador of the truth to the entire world. And what has God done in this age? He's chosen one little elected family of God. And what are you? You're the ambassador of truth to the entire world. He doesn't give the Canaanites the standard. He gives it to Israel. Only Israel has the standard. And they're all camped out under these. This is how they're to march. This is how they're to encamp. Let's go a little bit further. Reuben camps under the man, the flag. What was that standard? It was a flag. It was a flagpole that they carried. And under that flag, if you were to see Israel's encampment in that day, you would see those four flags. You would see one camped under the lion. And then under that campment, under that, under that flag, under that banner would be Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and all of their families camped under that lion standard. And then if you look to the, to the west, if you look to the west, you'd see Reuben. And under him, above his flag and the carriers of the flag, you would see the face of a man. And Reuben gathers under that flag. Notice this. The camp of Reuben has 46,500 people in it. It's a lot of people. 
And underneath Reuben, under the same signet as Simeon, was 59,300 people. And then Gad follows under the same banner, the same standard, the same anointing, the same flag, the same spirit. Gad falls under the same with 45,000 people. A total camped under the man standard of 151,450 men camped to the south. Moses didn't make this up. They surely didn't make this up. You see, people don't come under order automatically. But actually, your human nature automatically is in disorder. You are not ordered by anything except someone making you disciplined to bring order to your life. Let me say this, my brother and my sister. Order does not come through the opinions of man. Order comes by the word of God bringing order to your life. You want order in your home? Apply the word of God to your home. You want order in your family? Apply the word. It brings order to your house. People don't like order. (laughs) But God wants order. God says, Israel, you're going to camp this way. And now notice this. as, 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 As you look under Reuben, as he's camped under that signet, and now you have Simeon and Gad under that same flag of a man. And then you have Levi. Who was Levi? Part of the ministry, chosen by God, the priesthood. And where did they live? In the middle? At the tabernacle. That's where they camped. They lived constantly for the needs of the people. That's what a true minister is. A true priest, a true minister is is not a sage on the stage who's elite and doesn't have time for anybody. A true servant of God, a true minister of God cares for the affairs of the people. But what do you have in this age? You have kingdom builders and men who wear crowns like kings. And they got time for nobody and you got to come to their revelation. You got to come to their church. Pay your tithes to them. God never called those men. God is calling servants of the King, the Almighty King, the only King we have. Hallelujah. Notice under Ephraim, Ephraim is going to receive the ox standard. The standard of the ox, his flag after all of, all, all, of his, all of Ephraim's people. And Manasseh is going to be under that same exact standard. Ephraim's going to consist of 40,500 people. And Manasseh is going to be under that same standard with 32,200 people. And Benjamin also will fall under that ox flag. Benjamin will have 35,400 people, totaling 108,100 men camped to the west. You go further than that, and what do you have? You go further than that, and you have Dan. Dan's anointing, his flag, is going to be the picture of a flying eagle. And Dan's going to be under that anointing of an eagle. Dan is going to have, under Dan, he's going to have 62,700 people. Asher's going to fall under that same standard. He's going to live under that same banner. Asher's going to have 41,500 people. And Neptali is going to live under that same eagle standard. Neptali is going to have 53,400 people. A total under the eagle anointing of 157,600 men who are camped to the north. You say, Brother Matt, where did you get these numbers? Numbers. That's why the book's called Numbers. You say, why is numbers important? Why did did God think it important? Because every name who was going to be called under that anointing, God was going to have a specific name, a specific person, a specific army. Oh, my brother, God's family is not general and just generally speaking, but he knows exactly how many people are in his army. He has the elected numbered, my brother and my sister. You say, I'm part of the elected family of God because God specifically chose you. 
Oh, that ought to do something to your heart here tonight. That no, God, God didn't just go, I picked that group. God didn't look at a group of 100, 200,000, whatever it is, people, and say, I choose all of y'all. But God, by person to person, chose specifically every individual who would have a seat at the throne room of God. And I believe my name is in that, uh, has a seat at that table. My children have a seat at that table. My family have a seat at that table. There won't be one empty chair. Because there won't be one extra seat. At that marriage table, that marriage table has ex the exact number. We don't know what that number is. None of us know how many are the, in, the, in the elected family of God. I know how many God says there's going to be some who live under the anointing of the, of the lion. There's going to be Paul and Silas and Peter and that first age. And God had a very specific number for the Ephesian age. And when that final number came in, what happened? That age goes and the next age comes. God knew exactly how many would come under the ox anointing and have to give their lives as martyrs. He knew the exact number of elected people that would be called under Martin Luther's message. He knew exactly how many people would live in the days of John Wesley. He knew exactly how many there were. And my brother, he knows exactly how many elected are called to this message. We don't know how many, but what are we doing? We're searching till the last number is at our table. Hallelujah! God knows exactly who's elected and He won't lose one. <laughs> I'm so glad to know He won't lose any because He's already got them numbered. He knew exactly how many would come under Wesley, how many would come under Luther. And He knows exactly how many is going to be a under this anointing. And you can't force someone under this anointing that's not called under this anointing. You may try and you may persuade and you may beg and say, it's easy for me to see. Why can't you see it? Because you're called to live under this eagle flag. And you can't force anyone to live under that flag. Only who God called. He numbers all of Israel and they're to be encamped by their signet. Read it again in Numbers chapter 2 and Numbers chapter 1. He says that they shall, the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their host. What was it to the east, to the west? To the north, to the south, the eagle, the ox, the man, the lion. It was the ambassadors of truth to the entire world. And guess what? Every time they traveled, and they traveled a lot, they had to pick up their camp, pack it all up, and march in their order. No one was to get out of order. No one was to get out of step. If you were called to live under the eagle anointing, you can't go over to Dan. You can't go over to the lion anointing, lion flag, and just decide to pick up and move from this church to the other church. My brother, let me tell you something. God's called you to a specific place, a specific pastor, a specific state, a specific city, and you could try to go live somewhere else. It'll never work out. God planted you in the place he called you to, and you can only grow in that place that's why it's so important to find your position because you'll only be fruitful under that flag might have looked over at the next church you know Dan might have looked over and Dan might have seen you know it's a car and say, you know, I don't know. I, I like the way he preaches a little bit better. Been streaming him lately. You know, I like, like what he says. I like their music a little better. Sort of getting sick and tired of the same old song, same old song leader, same old music, same old pastor, same old preaching. 
What are you doing? You're trying to change your standard. God called you under a standard. He called you and put you in a certain place. And God says, be fruitful in that place. I'll bless you in that land. I'm calling order. I'm calling you to a position and to a place. I've called you under a certain anointing, a certain standard. And when you march Israel, you have to stay in this order. Do you want to know what that order looked like from an aerial view? Go to the next slide, brother. Here's what you had. You had the tabernacle in the center. You had Ephraim in the west. You had Reuben in the south. You had Dan in the north under the eagle. You had Judah under the lion in the east. Go to the next slide. This is what it looked like as they marched through the world. It was the emblem of a cross. What was it? It was salvation to the rest of the world as they marched through life. They were the ambassador of salvation. Glory! What was in the middle of everything? What was in the middle of all of their lives? The Holy Spirit. And my brother and my sister, this was so important that the the, the tabernacle was not at the front, not at the back, but at the center. Because the Holy Ghost should be at the center of everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, every thought you think. God says, I I have a position. You have a position. What is God's place in your life? At the center of everything else in your life should be the center, should be Christ and Christ alone. I want to say, Lord, let me make you the center. And as you march, you have to march in this order. No one break rank. No one break position. Everyone has to march in this order. For out of Judah, I'll send a Savior. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Israel had no idea but they were literally the ambassadors who were carrying the very seed of God. In that picture, God has everything invested. His entire plan. Do you realize that? He couldn't just say, sorry Israel, you failed, you messed up, I got to choose someone else. No. He had banked everything. He had invested everything in this one nation. And they didn't know, but they were, very, they were literally carrying the very plan, thought, purpose, mystery of God. Didn't look like it all the time. Looked like a mess most of the time. Looked rebellious, hard-hearted, calloused. Turned their back on God, spit in God's face. Would go sinning in the world, then come back to God repenting. But yet inside of that earthen vessel was the treasure that God deposited. Oh, my brother, I don't always look like the vessel of the carrier of truth. But God said, I've banked and placed everything. I put my very seed in your life. Do you realize you're the carrier of the plan and purpose of God? God says, I've placed it all in you. As the scripture says that they without us cannot be made perfect. You say, Brother Matt, why is that important? It's important that we hold the standard. It's important that we raise the standard. It's important that we don't drop the standard. Are you with me here tonight? Notice this as we go just a little bit further. Brother Random says this, and now now notice he says, now this here, Dan was an eagle. Reuben was the man's face. Ephraim is the ox. You get the picture? There's the way they camped in the Bible. He says, if you'll notice, Dan is the head of three tribes. Judah's the head of three tribes. Reuben's the head of three tribes. Ephraim's the head of three tribes. Three, four is 12, 12 tribes of Israel, each with their own banner. The banner of Judah was a lion. The banner of Reuben, man, the banner of Ephraim, an ox. 
banner of Dan was an eagle. Now look back at what John said. One had the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of a man. Notice the, 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 the face of a man, the lion, the ox, the eagle anointing. He says, let's here read, just see if it's not the same thing in heaven. The first beast was a lion, Judah. Second beast was a calf. There's the young ox. Third beast was the face of the man. The fourth beast, the flying eagle. Just exactly the tribes of Israel camped around. What were those Israel tribes? They were guardians to what? The tabernacle. They were guarding. That's why the, the Bible says if a stranger comes in, he'll be put to death. They were guarding what was, it wasn't the beauty it wasn't the lights. It wasn't the color. God wasn't concerned about the curtains and the beads and the silver and the bells and the whistles. Amen. That was not what they were guardians of. They weren't guarding the badger skin or the fine linen or the scarlet or the purple or the gold, the onyx, the barrel, the, the, the topaz, all of the precious stones. That was all important. But do you realize what they were guarding? They were guarding that cloud that you see right there in the middle because without that cloud all the beads and all the lights and all the all the whistles and all the colors meant nothing do you realize what your guardians of doesn't matter all your doctrine and all your theology, all your teaching. God didn't send us a message so we could be uh, puffed up in our head about how much we know about creation and how much we know about the revelation of God. And we're so smart and so intellectual and we just know we have all the secrets. And that The secrets meant nothing if the life of God is not behind those secrets and mysteries. You're not guardians of some intellectual knowledge or some pri intellectual property or a software or a program, or a tape, or a book. You're guardians of the very life and the Zoe Spirit of God. We're the guardians of the way back to eternal life. That spirit, that pillar of fire that filled the tabernacle was what was so important to God. That's a whole other sermon we ain't got time for. Notice this as they go through this. Now notice each being camped under their own sign. Each being camped under their own sign. Let me just find my place here. Uh, Brother Random says here, I know thy works. He says, I know thy works. Now notice this. In this age, God has given us a standard. Let me just get back to some of this here today. You're living in an age that is literally, the Bible says, is groping in darkness. They don't know it. They have, they have no idea. Do you realize man thinks he's smarter than he's ever been before? He thinks he's understood. The, we're, we're living in the age of information. It's the age, what they call this age that we're living in. We're, we're, but, but the Bible says, you're blind, miserable, wretched, poor, naked. And knowest it not. Behold, thou say, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest thou not. Brother Brandon said that wasn't arrogance. He said they literally looked at their own self with their own human pride and said, I'm perfect. I'm all-knowing. The age that we live in, the Bible says they're groping in darkness when the world... When the age, the information age today, people think they're more informed, smarter than they've ever been before. Uh, you're living in the age of the internet, of Google, of blogs. The advent of the blog where a man could get on and take the fodder of his own mind and express, not even not preaching against blogs here today. I'm simply telling you it should be a, 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 a signal to something. To where man has been given a platform to express what he thinks. And the mind has been exalted. Human thought, they've thought, that all we need is intellect. All we need is more knowledge. More than ever before, knowledge is increasing. And, and the human mind has been exalted to such a place we think it can, it can cure all diseases. It can't. We think we can, can, can cure all problems. It can't. The, the age in 2019 that we're living here today has the highest esteem of its own thinking. It's the age of 
information. As we said, where you can just Google anything and you think by what your results are giving you that you're gaining information and you're getting smarter and that could very well be the case. You could be gaining intellect. But most of what you're getting is the opinions of men, opinions of women, opinions, and at the very end of all of their education, all of their science, all of their schooling, it's just an opinion. Even medicine today is called practicing medicine. And you're the guinea pig they're practicing on. Pharmaceutical drugs and a multi-billion dollar industry. What are they doing? They're just testing, trying. At the end of the day, that they, they, they've solved. Hey, I'm not, not at all preaching against them. But Brother Random said this. He said, civilization, education, it's always moving away from dependence on God and moving to dependence on self. Amen. It's an age of self-validation where man is literally worshiping his own thinking. When they leave the truth, oh, what, what do we do? We, we, just, we, were to, we just use critical thinking. The internet has produced an entire generation of know-it-alls. Adults, not just children. I know, I know you thought I was talking about teenagers. <laughs> I'm talking about adults too. I know our teenagers know it all. I know they do. I won't question them. They know everything. <laughs> Know everything. <laughs> I told my son that to, teaching him to drive. I, and he kept, every time I'd correct something in his driving, he'd say, I know, I know. His first words, I know, I know. In other words, I, I, I hate that you're criticizing what I'm doing wrong. I know. And I finally said, Gideon, stop saying I know. He said, I know. I, I mean. <laughs> I said, you keep saying I know. I, I know. I mean, no, I didn't mean to say that. Everyone knows everything in this age. We're know-it-alls. We're living in the age of DIY. Some of y'all know what that is. Do it yourself. I'm, I'm appreciative of DIY. I use it to my own uh, advantage sometimes. DIY, Google search something, YouTube something. How do you do it? Don't, what, what do we live in? We live in an age where people say, I don't need a plumber. People tell me that all the time. I just will fix it myself. I got on the internet, I Googled, and I did this, and I fixed it, and thankfully sometimes they do. Other times, they're not successful. And when they call me and say, what, how much is your hourly rate? I say, that all depends. Have you touched it yet? Because <laughs> if you've tried to fix it yourself, and I have to undo your fixing, rate's a little higher. <laughs> Amen, Brother Mike. <laughs> You tried to fix it. I don't need a plumber. I can Google it. I, I can fix this thing myself. As I had a customer tell me one time as I walked into his house with, the, with, with four, uh, 40 gallons of water all over the floor because he thought he could install his own water heater. Guess what? He couldn't. He actually needed a plumber. I don't need an electrician. Oh, oh, I'd never say that, buddy. One thing I'm not, and that's whatever the opposite of an electrician is, that's me. I don't touch wires. I don't need an electrician. I can Google it. I can just Google it. Oh, Google will tell me what to do. It's never wrong. It's flawless. It's like the gospel. Whatever it says has to be true. I don't need a plumber. I don't need a mechanic. Don't need to take my car to mechanic. I can just fix it myself. I don't need a pastor. <laughs> I don't need a pastor. I can fix my own marriage. Self-help books, I can Google how to have a better marriage. I don't, need, I don't need you to fix my children. I don't need a pastor to tell me how to live. I can just Google. I don't need a church. Because now I have online church. Yeah, I'll preach it from down here. That's okay. <laughs> I don't need a church. I can do it myself. 
can do it all myself. Do you realize? I know it's funny, but I'm trying to get you to see something here. You're living in the age where man, the Bible said, would become a lover of his own self. And you're living in the climax and the maturity of that scripture. Don't need a church. I can just stream. And the next you say, I don't need a prophet. But here's what the word says. You're groping in darkness. Yet they think they're smarter than ever before. The world thinks they're more successful than ever before. They're more fulfilled than ever before. But let me take the covers and expose the world today. It is going insane. It is declining in insanity. It's more angry than it's ever been before. It's spewing with wrath. People are more confused and more lost than they've ever been before. You're living in a world that's more addicted than it's ever been before. Hooked on drugs, hooked on alcohol, hooked on pills. A world that is totally insane. This world is more broken than it's ever been because they've lost the standard of the word. It's an age. You say, what is the age? It's the age of information. But I ask you, what is that age of information produced? What is the age of the internet produced? Of people who are more addicted to pornography, more addicted to drugs, more addicted to popularity, more addicted to entertainment. Keep going, Brother Matt. Don't stop there. Keep going, keep going. Don't stop at entertainment. Because huh. we love our entertainment, but we're more addicted than we've ever been before. We've kicked the television out and now we're more addicted to Netflix and Hulu and YouTube. and Oh, I know y'all know what those names are. These mountains are big, but they don't shield you from the world, I promise. More addicted to entertainment. It's an age. What is the internet produced? Of people that are addicted to the internet. That's why it's called the World Wide Web. Because it draws you and pulls you and wraps you. What's it produced? It's produced more divorces, more broken marriages, more suicides in teens, more depressed teens, more depressed people, depressed in relationships. It's caused more adultery and men leaving their wives and women leaving their husbands than ever before. It has gone completely insane. I've said this and I'll say it again. There's a difference when you use the internet and when the internet uses you. And most of us are used and abused. More broken homes that are more broken. Churches that are more confused. Fire of the Holy Ghost gone more than it's ever been before. More stagnation and coldness in our churches. Less people at church, more people at home. I gotta say it. What was it? It's 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 given. It's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what is it? It's a standard that's been changed. Oh, my brother and my sister, they think they have success because of their information. And that information leads them from the message, tells them that the message is a cult, leads them to some other place. Where does it take them to? Addictions. Amen. Takes them to sin. Takes them to worldliness. Right. Takes them to depression. Takes them more closer and closer to the exaltation of number one. They haven't found Jesus. Amen. They found another Jesus. Amen. The Jesus of their imagination. Amen. The Jesus of their own standard or their own definition. But he says here, he says, Brother Branham says, what was it? It was a different standard. Can I just have just 10 more minutes? Would that be okay? He says, what was it? It was all camped under a different standard. Notice this here, brother. You're just following me along in the, in the quotes that you have up. If you could go to those now. 
Brother Branham says, what was it when the Spirit, when the enemy comes in like a flood? The Spirit of God raises a standard against it. So when the enemy went out as Antichrist, God sent a certain type of power out to meet him. He went out again as a red horse rider. Another color. Let me just, let me just find it here as you found it. There. That's paragraph 116. He says, there he went again as a red horse rider. Another color, another power, another ministry. I don't have all of these, so just follow along as I, as I read them. Another ministry. He says, God sent another one after him to combat it, to hold his church. That's what those standards were sent for. That's why they were under an anointing of a lion to hold the church, to hold the elected. He says he sent the third one. God sent his. Satan sent his. God sent his. Satan his, sent his antichrist spirit to defile the church, to combat the church. What did God do? God sent his. <laughs> he says... He sent the fourth one. God sent his fourth one. And then the Antichrist in and the church ages in at that time. Watch. He says, oh, this is really good. We see that devil's changing four beasts. Man, what power they was revealed to. Or what power he revealed to the world. How they ended up in this pale death horse. He says, let's look at God's powers of these beasts to combat them. The first beast of God went out to meet the Antichrist. The Antichrist spirit when it was in just its teaching. Remember, when the Antichrist first rode, he was in a teaching ministry. The Antichrist rode in a teaching ministry. Watch the one that went to meet him, the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Who were they under? Who was Paul under? Who was Peter under? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. All of those spirits, the lion, the man, the eagle, the ox, they were all the spirit of Christ. They were the throne guards. And those guardian, that spirit of, that, uh, 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 of God came upon the people. Brother Adam says, what was it? Let's look at God's powers. He says, watch the one that met and went to meet him, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is the word. When his false teaching went forth, the true word went to meet him. That's the reason we had an Irenaeus and a Polycarp and those fellows, a St. Martin, when the Antichrist was writing with his false teaching. God sent his teaching out. The word, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why do you think the apostle Paul could say, when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come in the power of my own intellect or man's wisdom, but I came in the power and the demonstration. What was Paul saying when I came to you? It wasn't coming with a word of intellect to combat intellect for intellect, but God sent an anointing of a lion upon the church, the lion of the tribe of Judah, to combat the antichrist spirit. I came unto you, under the power of the Holy Ghost. He said that's why they had to have him. He says when the Antichrist was writing with his false teaching, God sent his teaching, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is the Word made manifest in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit there to manifest himself, which is the Word. That's the reason the early church had healings and miracles and visions. That's the reason. You mean it wasn't because of how dedicated they were? Wasn't because of how perfect they were? Wasn't because of how spotless they were? Wasn't because of how intellectual? No. That's the reason they had miracles, signs, wonders, healings, vision, powers. Because a living word in the form of the lion of the tribe of Judah, rode through their lives, anointed the lives of insufficient men, anointed the lives of imperfect women, imperfect teenagers, people with mistakes and faults and failures, but an anointing of God so filled their life that no devil in hell could stand before that first church. Because why? The living word of God. Oh, hallelujah. He says, now the second beast went out. Was a red beast that he rode on. Was to take the place in the earth in war. Second one that went to combat him was the ox beast. The ox means labor. Beast of burden. If we get to stop, let, let me tell you, just to be sure you see this. That's the kind that might be a little puzzling. And, and move, on, move on just past this, brother, to the next quote that you have. Just the, the very next slide. He says, amen. Now you got it. He sends his power. I love this. 
He says he sends his power. Antichrist, God sends his word. Antichrist, false teaching, the true teaching went with it to combat it. Now that was the first one. Now this was the first church apostolic that went out to meet him. Keep going, brother. He says, now notice this, he says, and another thing, the ox is also a beast of sacrifice. See, they just gave their lives just as freely as they could give them in the dark ages. A thousand years there that Catholicism controlled the world. They just gave their lives as freely as they could give them. Why? They were under an anointing. They gave their lives as freely as they can give them. I love this. He says they went out and died. They didn't mind dying. He says, uh, he, he says here, they just went right in, yes or no. They didn't mind dying. They didn't mind dying? What, did they, did they not like their life? Did they not love their life like you love yours and I love mine? And there's nothing wrong with saying that. You love life. No one likes to die. Let me tell you something, my brother and my sister. These people under the ox anointed in those dark ages were no different than you and me. But something got a hold of their life. Something got a hold of these ordinary people. They weren't morbid in their mind. They loved their children. They loved their lives. They didn't want to die. He says, but they didn't mind dying if it was death. That's all right. They went and died anyhow. Why? The very spirit of the age. What was it when they held a gun, when they they, they told them, denounce Christ? Refute Christ, denounce him. Denounce him or I'll burn the house down with your children in it. You say, oh my, what would I do in that situation of persecution came to such a point? If persecution came to such a point to where they were going to take my life, oh, I don't know what I could do. You know why you don't know what you could do? They didn't know what they could do either. The difference is is that they were under an anointing of a standard that God had sent. You're not under that anointing. But they were under a power. And let me say this, my brother, my sister, it was a power that was not within themselves. It was very much without of themselves. It was very much a power that God had released to combat the Antichrist spirit. And they willingly gave their life. That's the reason, Irenaeus, that's the reason. Go on, Polycarp, Paul, John, those great mighty men out there combating that thing. Polycarp was fed to the lions. He says, you know, he was burned. It was too late for them to turn a lion loose on the arena. So they tore down a bathroom. Imagine this. An old bathhouse there. Put him in their arena and burned him. And on his road coming down, he was walking with his head down. The Roman centurion said, you're an old man. Oh, well, respected Polycarp. Why don't you just denounce it? So easy. Just denounce this thing. It's so simple. I mean, you know, just denounce it. And, and God knows what you mean. You know, wink, wink, you know, cross your fingers. You know, God, God isn't going to look at that polycarp. Who cares what people say? And you could always go back and repent. You know, Peter was restored and denied Christ. No doubt the devil could say anything to polycarp. And he could put any thought and whisper anything in his mind. You're an old man, well respected. Why don't you just denounce that thing? He just kept looking towards heaven. Oh, glory to God. Can you see that saint there? As the as brother Adam says, he kept looking towards heaven, and a voice spoke from somewhere. They couldn't understand where. Said Polycarp, "Don't fear, I am with you." Uh-huh. Why? He was standing with that word. And they began to pile boards on him to burn him. There was a heavenly music come down. The anthems from some angelic somewhere sang the song. He never even one time batted an eye to the scoffer. That's gallant men. That's men who can stand martyrs down through the ages. They suffered terribly, but what was they? They were under the inspiration. 
the Spirit of God, the power of God. They couldn't explain why they were living the way they were living. Polycarp couldn't give you and take a chalkboard and draw it out. All he knew was there was an anointing upon his life. He must fulfill the word that God has put in his life because God sent an anointing upon his life. You say, how was Polycarp an overcomer? The same way you're going to be an overcomer. Not because of you, not because of yourself, but an anointing of an eagle that anoints your life to overcome the world. How could he do it? The inspiration of God came upon his life. Now, don't forget this church, brethren, on the tape. I want you to examine this. How could men do anything else besides the power of God that has been released? Released to them. Oh, do we, do we catch this, my brother and my sister? Or are we catching our message, our day, and it's our? Are we catching it here today? He says, how could they do it apart from anything but the power of God that's, going, that's been released to them? He says, I'm going to sit this box up here to represent that. If God sends a sp- certain spirit among them, that's the only thing they can work by. You say, were they possessed? They were. Yes right answer were they possessed they were possessed of a spirit from another world they were possessed from a spirit that came directly from the throne room of God and entered into their heart you say how I could never do that I I put myself in that position brother they couldn't have done it either apart from the power of God that God had sent to their life and you can't do anything. You say, how am I going to? Well, what's in front of us? God isn't calling us to give our life at a stake or to be burned. That's not the anointing that you're facing. But a spirit has been released in this age from the Antichrist called a pale horse rider. And that pale horse rider is a conglomeration, a mixture of every spirit. Do you realize what you're facing every day when you woke up this morning? It may have felt like an ordinary day, but in another dimension, every demon in hell was trying to afflict you and mess up your family and mess up your children and assault your mind and assault your marriage. Every demon spirit was trying to affect you. Do we realize what we're facing, my brother and my sister? We're facing Satan's grand finale. Where he pulls out every play from the playbook. Where he pulls out every trick, every scheme. You're in the darkest age. You're in the darkest time. You're in a time of more confusion. Where our world's going insane. And Satan has every gun trained on you. But God says, what is God going to do to stand back and say, figure it out? You're just going to have to figure it out. No. God says, from the throne room of God, I'm going to send an eagle anointing to make you rise up out of the world. Rise up out of your depression. Rise up out of your trouble. And fly into an atmosphere where there's peace and joy. Oh, can you say amen? And happiness and love. God says, I've got an anointing. And just as much as Polycarp, just as much as the the martyrs through the dark ages had no chance of overcoming the spirit of their age apart from an anointing, neither do you have any chance. Unless you're under this eagle anointing. You see why it's so important to be under your anointing. And God has a very specific anointing for this age. And that creature is not a man. We didn't get time to it, but another age. Uh, the Brother Branham says, what did God have to do? He had to send, send the spirit of a man. A shrewdness and intellect that came to man. But that's not the spirit you're under. Some people think that's what they're under, the spirit of intellect and man, and man followers and man worshipers, and, and, but that's not the spirit we're under. 
We're not following a man. We're not looking to a man. We're looking to an eagle, the great eagle, the mighty God unveiled. And God says, you got to come under the anointing of the eagle if you want to rise above it. I say tonight, I want to rise above my problems. I want to rise above my troubles. I want to rise. Does anybody want to rise here tonight? Say, I want to come out of my depression. Come out of my, my issue and my trial. I want to fly into the heavenlies. Oh, somebody say, praise the Lord here tonight. I'm going to fly above all my problems. Oh, stand to your feet here tonight. Say, God, give me that spirit to rise above it. I don't care what that is for you tonight. I don't care what problem you face or, or issue that your mind's going through right now. God says, I've got the spirit of a creature. And he's not an earthbound creature. He's a creature that can fly out of these atmospheres of negativity and trouble and sickness and worry. He can rise into another atmosphere. All you got to do is climb up on his wings. All you got to do is climb up on his wings and say, Lord, raise me up out of the trouble. Raise me up out of the problem. Raise my family, my children out of Lady Osea. Bring them into a heavenly atmosphere. Oh, give the Lord a hand clap of praise here tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to rise above it here tonight. As we raise our hands, Lord, across this building. You've called us to raise up a standard. And to hold that standard high. To keep that flag raised. That flag. That anointing. Lord, you sent us a prophet messenger. Under that eagle anointing. And he could see, Lord, you gave him vision. A gift. A message. A word. You gave him a word, Lord. A word that would meet the challenge of this day. You've not asked us to give our opinion, to add, to take. But you've called us to camp under that standard. Let us do that tonight, Lord. Lord, if we've fallen out of that encampment, may we, may we reestablish, may we let the word Reestablish us under that anointing. For this word has an anointing upon it. Satan attacks it from every side, from within, from without, from ministry, from people, from outsiders, from the Lord, from every way, from society. We have every gun trained against us, Lord, but in this word is a power that will lift this bride off the earth someday. One day, Lord, we're going to take our flight like a mighty eagle. Today, Lord, we're living in Satan's Eden, an age that's darker than ever before. Harder, Lord, today to discern right from wrong. World mixed with opinions. World mixed with ideas. All motivated by fear. Motivated by greed. Motivated by pride. Lord, but you've not called us to feed upon that. But you've given us a word that we can feed upon, Lord. And in that word, we can receive life. If we're weak, we can raise a hand tonight. You can raise them tonight and say, Lord, I need strength. Would you give me strength from that word? I'm an eagle. I'm feeding upon that word. I don't want to feed on dead, a carrying dead carcass somewhere. I want to feed upon that word where I can receive strength for my journey. Where I can receive revelation when I need it. I can receive help when I need it. Health when I need it. Lord, I pray that you'd grant that to each and every single person here tonight, Lord. May we realize, Lord, there's power in this word. There's power being encamped in the right encampment. You're calling us to march, Lord calling us to move and stay in order stay in step don't get out of line don't start looking at the other church don't start looking at that witch as brother Adam sees in that vision and he screams stay in line get back in line get back in step oh God let me let me say that tonight Lord I want to get back in step 
I want to get back in line with your word, oh God. I want to be marching to the, to the right rhythm, to the right tune, to the right beat. Grant it, Lord Jesus. The Roman army was one of the most successful armies. You study history. Roman army was one of the most successful armies, conquered the entire known world. And you notice what was different about the Roman army. They all dressed the same. They all looked the same. Those Romans looked different than everybody else. There was strict uniformity. They all had to wear the same clothing. Same hat, same hair, same everything. Everything had to be the same. They were different than the rest of the world. And their success was in their uniformity, the unity that the Roman army had. They conquered the entire known world, as we said. Part of their success was their communication. They had trumpet blowers, people that would blow a certain sound that would signal a different command. It was death. You could be put to death if you blew the wrong, uncertain sound. That, that trumpet player, it was so important for him to blow the right tune. Because the entire army was dependent upon the sound that they heard from that trumpet. The Bible says that if the trumpet blow an uncertain sound, who can prepare himself to battle? And this, this Roman army was so unified in purpose. They had a loyalty amongst them. Everywhere they went, they wore the badge, the signet. They had a flag, and on that flag was the face of Caesar. They had a loyalty to their king, and they all shared that common loyalty. And that flag was always put before them to constantly be raised up to remind them, you're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for a greater purpose, a greater cause. And oh, my brother, that Roman army fought for a carnal purpose. But today, we're part of an army. And God has called us to a uniformity. God has called us to be an army where we all look the same. We all dress the same. We all speak the same language. And we all have a banner, a flag. And there's a face on our flag. And it's the face of our king. And every time the prophet of God, what would he do? He would lift the name of Jesus. He wouldn't lift the name of a man. He wouldn't lift the name of an opinion. But he would raise the name of Jesus to remind the army, this is who you're fighting for. That Roman army eventually found its demise. And historians say that the main reason why the Roman army was defeated and the Romans fell was for one simple reason. They changed their requirements for membership. You see, to be in the Roman army before, you had to be a Roman citizen. Had to be. You had to be born a Roman. That's why Paul, when he's before Festus in Acts 25, and in the book of Acts, Paul says, I'm a Roman by birth, a citizen, natural born citizen by birth. It meant something to be born But when they changed their citizenship, it allowed hired mercenaries from other countries to join the Roman army. Lasted for for, for a long time. But eventually what happened when you brought outsiders into the Roman army, they didn't all speak the same language. So communication broke down. Not only that, they weren't all loyal to Caesar. But they were in that army for their own purposes. And they allowed anybody to join the army. And then what happened when they couldn't speak the same language? Confusion came. And the army dispersed and fell apart. My brother, my sister, don't you realize why it's so important that we don't change our method of membership? And our method of membership into this army is not a book, not shaking a preacher's hand, not paying your tithes, but you've got to be born by the Holy Spirit. That's the standard that God's given to the church. The only way in this army is to be born in this army. And if you're not born, you can be born again here tonight. You can be born into that army. It was an important thing that they kept the standard. Eventually, the dress code changed 
the signets change, the standard change. And that's what the devil's trying to attack in our generation as our standard. The standard of the word, the standard of holiness is on an outright assault by the enemy. Yeah. An outright assault. You take the Civil War, same way, the, but the, 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 the Confederate Army, the, the Union Army, they all had signet, insignia. They had a banner. They had a sign that they had to hold. They had a flag bearer. And that flag bearer, if you go read history of the Civil War, that man who bore the flag was one of the most, outside of the general, was one of the most important men in the army. The flag bearer. He also had the shortest life expectancy. Because the enemy trained their guns on the flag bearer. Because he bore the standard of the army. What was his position? His position was to show where the line was so you didn't get in front of the line, so that you weren't behind the line. His position was to bear the flag of the army of the battalion that they were in. That was their purpose. The flag was to bring position. Why did God send an eagle anointing? To bring us to our position in the family of God. And the most important role was the flag bearer. Because when the, when the fire, when the shots started being fired and war got hot and smoke began to billow and men's minds as they were shell-shocked by the sound of cannons and smoke was everywhere and they hit the ground and the army was, was scattered. What did they do? They looked up. They were trying to find that flag because they knew if they could see the flag, if they could see the standard, they could get to the right position in the right place of the army. But the devil knew if I could take out the, st the flag bearer, if I could shoot the, if I could take out the, the standard bearer, the confusion will ensue. And it'll bring mass sin in the churches and mass confusion to the people. That's why the devil is attacking our standard. But here's my message tonight. Raise up the standard and hold your flag high. I want to say, how many can say that here with me tonight, Lord? Let me raise up my standard. When the enemy comes rushing in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard. Oh, give the Lord a hand clap of praise here. Give Him a praise offering. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Sing it again now. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory. Oh, yes. Oh, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Give me in the right key. Let's go up. Give me a verse, Brother Joel. Can you sing it for me? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Give me that verse, brother. Mine, Mine eyes, eyes have seen, seen the, glory the glory of the coming. Of the he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He's loosed the fearful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Here's what's marching on, his truth. How many can say his truth? It's not slow, it's not retreating, it's not running backwards, this army's not scared. It's marching forward, onward, Christian soldier. Sing it for me, brother. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Oh, he yes. is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He had loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Oh, his, his truth is marching on. Glory, 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 hallelujah. His truth is marching on. 
I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have pounded him an altar in the evening news and dance. I can read his righteous righteous sentence by by the the dim and flaring lights. His day is marching. Oh, yes, sing it now. trumpet that shall never sound retreat he is sifting out the hearts of men yes, before Lord. his judgment seat oh be, be swift my soul, soul to answer be him jubilant be my jubilant feet. my feet our god is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah Hallelujah, his truth is marching. You gotta take that up for me. I'm in the basement. Let's get up. Let's get out of the basement there. Let's go up, Brother Joel. What is that? No. No, that's you, brother. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, sing it. Glory, glory. His truth is marching. Oh, that's it. Sing it now. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory. Oh, yes, Lord. His truth is marching. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Going up yonder, Brother Joel, can you sing that again? Going up yonder. Got an announcement that says spring forward, set your clocks up one hour. Amen. Don't want to be late for church tomorrow, so set them forward. Amen. One hour. Sing that for me, Brother Joel. Do you want to know? If you want to know where I'm going. Someday, someday soon. Oh, if anybody asks you, got a lot of nosy people. Where I'm going? Why you live that way? Where, where I'm going? I'm going oh, one day soon. Oh, I'm going up the yonder. I'm going up a yonder, yes Lord, I'm going up a yonder to be with my Lord. The pain and the heartache it brings. The heartache that life Here's how so with the comfort I have comfort in, in knowing, knowing how soon be go soon on wings and fly away. As God gives me grace. Amen. As God gives me grace, I'll run. I run this Christian race. Oh, until I see him. Until I see my Savior. Face to face Oh, I'm going up yonder I'm going up yonder I'm going up yonder To be with my Lord Oh, I'm going up yonder I'm going up Second. 
like a verse now. I can take now the I can take the pain. The, pain. the heartache the that pain. life is showing. I have comfort in knowing way. one day that I'll soon, I'll soon be in this world goodbye. God, oh, is. God has given me grace. Oh, I'm gonna run this race. I'm gonna run this Christian race. Yes, Lord. Until I see my Savior face to face. Oh, I'm going in the rapture. Going in the rapture. I'm going in the rapture. Oh yes, Lord. I'm going. Going in the rapture to be with my Lord. To be with my Lord. God bless you as you go sing it. Yeah, I'm going in the rapture. I'm going in the rapture. I'm going in the rapture. 